EBTN Live is on your device, which means it's officially baseball season. First episode of this show of 2023. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thanks for reverse boycotting the show and joining <laughs> us here in the studio. Sam Ravitch, Drew Carter, great to be here. We got a loaded slate, Sam. We're talking about division by division recaps in case you're just tuning in for the first time to baseball. You've been watching NBA yep. Finals, Stanley Cup Final. We'll get you up to speed, plus some Father's Day trivia. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there, including Carl Ravitch, who's on the call tonight for baseball tonight, getting you ready for Yankees and Red Sox. Plus, Sam, you're going to be looking stupid, which is always fun on TV. Well, first off, it's not that hard to do. Uh, but, yes, uh, our good friend Scooby and I went down. We had to uh, try to hit uh, baseball against some teenage pitchers, and it did not go well. So. Yeah. All right. Well, that's coming up later yep. in the show. We can't wait. If you want to see Sam embarrass himself, as I think he does, yeah. stick around it's worth it. for that. And so it's a lot to lift on this show. So it's not just us. We're bringing in a ringer. We're bringing in Clinton Yates, who joins us from just outside <laughs> Philly. Clinton, you've been watching baseball all season, right? So you, you actually know what you're talking about here? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the idea. I have been watching all season, but uh, – you know, that period of time right when the NBA season ends, I think is when a lot of fans kind of kick back into gear coming off of the end of the playoffs with that and the NHL. So figured we could give them some things to talk about, uh, you know, to shore things up now that we're in mid-June. So we pretty much know who's doing what. Yeah, that's right. This is the time of year where yeah. top 10 on SportsCenter is basically all diving catches. So <laughs> right. let's get you up to speed with what's been happening in case you are just tuning in for the first time. Let's start with the sexiest division every year and also the best division this year, the AL East. You notice all five of these teams are above 500 now after the Red Sox took the first leg of the doubleheader against the Yankees earlier today. The Rays, of course, the best team in baseball. They've got five more wins than anyone else. They're the first team to 50. <coughs> but let's focus on the team in second place there, Baltimore, who's not only second place in the AL East, they're tied for the second best record in the entire American League. So, Clinton, when you look at this Orioles season to date, what stands out to you and what are your expectations for them the rest of the way? You know, I think organizationally, Baltimore is one of those teams that was sort of forgotten about because for so many decades, they were just sort of more abundant and people looked at them as a team with a nice ballpark but weren't really doing a lot but nowadays i mean they actually got their young guys up and they're playing them in major league baseball games adley rushman has looked great Gunnar henderson's looked great as well this team hasn't gotten swept in a series since last may like that tells me a lot about who they are just in general they do not have a ton of bad runs they stay they hang around they stay around and this team is legit good I think they're going to beat somebody in the in the postseason if they play them. I don't think this is just a flash in the pan. This is a talented squad that knows that they know how to win. Yeah, I'm with you there, Clinton. Of course, and I look. I was fortunate enough to call minor league baseball games uh, in the in the Eastern League Double A. I was with Richmond, and we got to see the Bowie Bay Sox come in. And you had players on that team like Orion Mountcastle, who leads the team in home runs. You had players like Austin yeah. Hayes, Cedric Mullins, and just calling those games, you could tell. They don't belong here. They don't belong in double A. <laughs> and we've seen teams right. in the past, right, Clinton, who just you know, front offices want to limit the service time. They want to keep that clock, um, you know, not going for as long as they can. And whether Michael Elias liked it or not, I think he had to bring those guys up. And what a novel idea. They are playing <laughs> like Major League Baseball players, Drew. Yeah, putting your best right. guys in the big leagues, right, Clinton? <laughs> Amazing. Cedric Mullins, all-star and Team USA guy. He's probably the vocal leader of that team in terms of a veteran overall. Like, yeah, that's a real deal good team, not just a bunch of young guys goofing off. All right, so we're going to go from the best division in baseball here, Clinton, to maybe one that's struggling a little bit right now. Middle America right now, the AL Central, is not doing all that well. You see the standings right there. Uh, the Twinkies with a three-game lead over the Guardians. Right. And Drew, Don't I, let them get high. I know you grew up a Twins fan. <laughs> Does this give you any confidence with where they're at right now to not only can they close it out, can they win in the postseason? That's the question to you. Uh, yes and no. You know they're winning this division with like 86 wins, right? I mean, that, that is my childhood there. Mid-2000s when the Twins, we call them the Piranhas. They were small balling their way to a division championship, it felt like, every year. Dinking and dunking like Nick Punto, Luis Castillo, Alexi Casillas. Those guys were just singling their way to a division championship every year. And then we would get swept by usually the Yankees. I remember one time there was a headline in the New York Post, and those headlines were always entertaining. And it said, easy pass. Yankees draw Twins in the first round. I'm like, here we go. I'm so angry. Like, the Twins are going to be so fired up. No way we lose this series. 
we got swept in three games. So, Clinton, any hope for the Twins if they do win this division, you think, to make some noise in the playoffs? The injury situation with Buxton makes it so hard to forecast whether or not they're going to be any good. He's the best player on that team. He's one of the best players in the bigs, but he never seems to be there when they need him from an availability standpoint. So, no. I do not have much faith in the Twinkies as much as I like their new uniform setup they've got with the new M and all of that. I just It's hard to bank on them when they don't feel like they can get right in the, uh, in the injury column. So that's what's up with the Twins. Does anyone else have any other thoughts on the uh, AL Central? All right, awesome. Let's go to the uh, AL West where the Rangers, perhaps as a surprise to some, they're cruising. They're in first place by four and a half games, but... The fly in the ointment here is Jacob deGrom out with another Tommy John surgery. Nathan Avaldi pitching lights out, probably the best season of his career so far. So, Clinton, is Texas is starting pitching enough to where they can win this division without deGrom? I think it is, but I think it is only by a sliver. We could get into a whole separate conversation about what it's like with guys getting double Tommy John surgeries in their careers right now. And I feel badly for the Rangers because they were a team that really tried this offseason they went out and spent some cash got arms got better in their lineup and to see that sort of you mentioned a fly in the ointment to see it sort of hiccup like this because of the Grom is unfortunate but let's not forget the Rangers have the best run differential in the league and that includes the race who they're tied at the top four they score a ton of runs this is a team that I do think will be able to overcome a DeGrom not necessarily being there you know all season like you wanted them to be because they're just that good at the plate. I think there's a little magic brewing down there in Arlington in that ballpark. Yeah, no no doubt about it. But let's take it back a little bit here, Drew, because the rebuild for Texas, you saw it kind of in the works last year. It was their sixth losing season in a row last year, right? They lost 94 games. But right. there, were, there, were, there was, uh, you know, at least a sense that things were getting on the right track. They went 15-35 and 35 in one-run games last year. Like, you have to try – <laughs> to replicate that again the yeah. next season. Like, that's historically bad. Josh Young, of course, is certainly going to be in the running for Rookie of the Year this year with the way that he's playing. And what makes him so great, I think, Drew, is, you know, the, the fact that he plays like a 10-year vet. He doesn't do anything super flashy, maybe, but the, the glove absolutely plays at third. He ranks in the 90th percentile in hard hit rate this year. And remember, he missed most of last year with a shoulder injury, and he just didn't look all that comfortable when he got called up in September this year. The, the swing and miss is down. This team is hitting a ton of home runs, as Clinton said as well. They score a ton. I think the question for them is going to be, can they continue to have those starting pitchers go out and give them some depth? And this is going to be an interesting team, too, and we'll talk about it at the trade deadline. Like, do they go out and be yeah. aggressive, right? I, I think that's going to be something to watch for. Yeah, Young, Young could start at third base for the AL in the All-Star game, sure right? Could. Marcus Simeon probably a lock to do so. And, and like you mentioned earlier this week, Sam, DeGrom hasn't pitched a whole lot for them anyway this year. So they should be just fine and an awesome season for Texas so far. Elsewhere in that division, though, how about the Halos? How about the Angels? I think a lot of us were kind of resigned, Clinton, to never seeing Mike Trout play in the playoffs again, never seeing Shohei Otani play in the playoffs for the Angels at least. That's why it's such an interesting story, right? Because it's not just that they're in the playoff hunt, but this could change how the Shohei Otani free agency unfolds after this season. Well, and that, I think, is the bigger discussion. I mean, you know, look, the AL West, I, th I mean, I believe that, you know, people think that that's a reasonably good division, but I don't think anybody's looking at any of those teams to make a deep run. But the question long term about what you do about Otani is a real one. If you have the best season you've had in recent history with him, it's going to be really hard to justify the fact that you might want to try to get rid of him. And a lot of people think that there's this sort of catch-22 in between where, well, if he's going to possibly walk for it not for nothing, well, then you should try to trade him. But then again, and who wants to be the person that trades Shohei Otani? <laughs> like, I'm sorry. There's no real world in which that's easy to justify to Angels fans by saying, well, we're going to get nothing. Yeah, but you had Shohei. So why would you get rid of him? I mean, it's... It's unfortunate because I think that all of the speculation about where he's going to go has led to the possibility that everybody just thinks it's a foregone conclusion. And so if you're out there in Anaheim, which is where they play, I went to the yard about six weeks ago, um, you know, it's just kind of this weird part, purgatory, if you will, where you're just kind of hoping that you're good, but at the same time, you're worried that Shohei's going to go away. And so I, it's a very tough time right now um, for Angels fans, but they do at least have wins to look forward to, so... 
We'll see what goes on. Right. Yeah, they're winning games, which is complicating matters for the Angels. And <laughs> yeah. right. the, the biggest story in that division is the worst team, the Oakland A's. Uh, obviously, you probably heard, even if you're not following baseball, what happened at Odaco Coliseum earlier this week, and we will talk about that later on in the show. But for now, let's go over to the NL and hit on the NL East first with the Atlanta Braves, a team that – a lot of people say is the best team in the NL, maybe the best team in the bigs. Uh, is that what you think, Clint? Do you think the Braves have the best chance of anyone to win the World Series this year? Well, I think they're the best baseball team. I mean, when they won the World Series, they did it with 88 wins, which is the worst in the playoffs at the time, and that team's only gotten better. And to me, you know, they're 20 games above 500. Michael Harris is a player that has been slumping a little bit recently, but when he decides he wants to play well and he does well, he's one of the best uh, center fielders in the big, they upgraded arguably Freddie Freeman with Matt Olson. They've still got the guys Acuna and um, Ozuna as well. Like they're stacked top to bottom. If I had to pick a baseball team to just A, watch play baseball, B, win one game because of their pitching staff as well, I think I'm going with the Braves. They're just too good. Yeah, I, I'm with you there, too, and what Alex Anthopoulos has done, obviously, over the last half yeah. decade, right? I mean, it's certainly considered one of the best, if not the best, front offices in all of baseball. You know, he's got guys locked up through 2026. You talk about Albies, you talk about, um, you know, all these guys, Acuna, Riley, Harris, they're all locked up through 2026. So this, this team's not only built for success this year, they're built for success in the long run. A very well-run team in the Atlanta Braves. Can't say the same for the New York Mets, no matter how much money they throw at that roster, Sam. It's quite the contrast between those two organizations. No question about it. And, and, and look, the Mets are going to Mets at times, right? They're one of the best uh, lovable fan bases in, in all of baseball. But if we're being honest, the Mets struggle, and correct me if I'm wrong, Clinton, here, the Mets' struggles this year didn't start on opening day. The Mets' struggles started, to me, at, at the trade deadline last year, where they really just kind of <clears> flopped. And uh, look, it's certainly the opinion of the Mets fans. It's the opinion of, of, of me as well. They just not only didn't get better, they got worse at the trade deadline last year. They did not set themselves up for success. Um, but I, I, I will say this. You pay a lot of money to Verlander and Scherzer. You expect them to be those guys. Verlander with the Cy Young um, last year. You had you know Scherzer with a couple of Cy Youngs a couple of years ago. He was great last year as well. So, you know, I would pose the question, like, who would you rather have had if you're a Mets fan going into this year? Because if those guys give you 100 quality innings, we're having a different conversation. I, they just haven't lived up to the billing this year. That, that, that's the story for me, Clint. I, I don't know about you. I, I, I tend to agree with you. they got to figure out who they want to be because they've tried to play it both ways, and that doesn't really work when the money you're spending is on dudes that are not performing, especially at that advanced age. I thought from the beginning that it did not make a ton of sense to give Verlander that kind of cash. And Scherzer has been a guy who for the last – five weeks or whatever it has been this season. Just can't seem to get it together. He's complaining with umpires, arguing about warm-up pitches. We got sticky stuff issues. It's feeling like the wheels are coming off for a guy who is very much one of the more intense pitchers in baseball. That's part of it. But his ERA has ballooned up over five this year, and he just doesn't look like the same guy. You can see him right here in Dodger Stadium throwing full-blown tantrums. For a veteran in the league, for this to be the tone of how your dugout is operating is not good to me. He's supposed to be a dude that sets the tone, not the person that's out there whining every time he's on the mound. And I think the <laughs> Mets have kind of shown that in who they are. That's going to Mets, right? I mean, opening day, yeah. here's the pitch, and the season's over. They didn't even make it to the first pitch this year before Edwin Diaz yeah. uh, went down with that knee injury in the WBC. Right. So, so that's what's going on in the NL East. Uh, the middle of the country this year is kind of like the middle child. Not getting a whole nice. lot of attention, Good right? Comparison. Right. The AL yeah. Central, the worst records in the league. NL Central backs them up as the second worst statistically division in the league. But, Sam, you know who is getting a whole lot of attention? That's Ellie De La Cruz. By the way, if anyone was watching the Reds play this year, this year really, and today, Ellie De La Cruz had a line drive at first base. It was short hopped um, by, by the first baseman, and he beat it out today. He beat out a yeah. line drive to first base. Base. And this is happening kind of every day. Keep in mind, too, that this kid's 21 years old. He's essentially a draft eligible junior in college. And we can sit here and just list off Ellie De La Cruz stats all day. But here's just a couple of them for you. After three days in the big leagues, guys, three days, he had the Reds' two hardest hit balls of the year, fastest sprint time in MLB this year as well. And, and I mean, just to go off that, his first home run that he hit in the big leagues this year wasn't just the hardest hit ball for the Reds this year. It was the hardest hit ball for the Reds in the last four years, Drew. So, um, you know, not only does he walk the walk, he talks that talk, too. Yeah, the thing about yeah, him that's so striking. 
so striking to me is you, you mentioned he beat that throw to first base. He did it on a head first slide too. Like this guy's playing exciting baseball. It's not just the numbers. It's not just the stat cast. And he's doing it at the shortstop position. I mean, look at his body type. He looks like the kind of guy that should be a goalkeeper on a World Cup yeah. team in terms of that kind of length and that kind of speed operating on the dirt. Never mind how hard he throws it. This is a throwback to the to Cal Ripken's oh, yeah. of the world. Mm. Big shortstops. You know what I mean? The Alex Rodriguez is. You don't see this body type. Formally there. I mean, look at this play. You kidding me? He's coming over the top with a full. I mean, he's not even at a three quarter delivery there. That's a straight over the top. He 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 is an athlete that is just chosen to play baseball. That's what he is, and it's really quite a throwback to see. And I really hope that the, the Reds can. I don't want to say make some noise, but that they can find a way to get him in the lineup every day and keep him on the infield and not just stretch him out because he's got a little speed. He's a smart player, and it's fun to see that available on the dirt. Yeah, O'Neill Cruz burst onto the scene for Pittsburgh last year, and this is like O'Neill Cruz 2.0 yeah. for the L.A. De La Cruz. <laughs> it's like people call him a creative player in MLB The Show. I actually don't even think you could create a player this good. You'd probably run out of attribute points and, and size points because yeah. that's, that's the type of guy we're talking about. He's been unbelievable in, in a short stint for the Reds so far. But I think for people – I'll also say – Reds, yeah, the Reds ahead, have a decent young core, too. They've got yes. Hunter Green on the mound, who's one of the biggest stars. Jonathan India was up there in the Rookie of the Year voting last year. I mean, this is a, another team. They're not quite uh, clearly as developed as the Orioles, for example, but there's good things to come, I think, at this stage in Cincinnati when it's been years and years of just wasteland stuff with only Joey Votto to speak of. This is actually a squad that I think people are going to enjoy watching for a little bit. And, Clinton, before we leave the Central, you want to give a shout-out, right? Oh, yeah. I got to give a shout out to my man, Devin Williams. He's the best closer in the game. Uh, he just had his blown save streak broken. I think it was this, you know, he'd, had, he'd gone so far without blowing a save. It, it happened last month or last week. But yeah, man, Devin, also another Team USA guy who pitched a lot in the World Baseball Classic. The Airbenders, which you know him of, which is that sick changeup that he throws so well. All right, so that's what's happening in the NL Central. Guys, I think if, if anyone's checking the standings for the first time in the middle of the season, this might be the biggest yeah. surprise. Arizona at the top of the NL West. Think of the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Padres, all expected to be potential World Series contenders this year, and it's the Diamondbacks at the top of the NL West, and Sam, it's another rookie leading the charge. We've got some great rookies, by the way, um, throughout baseball this year. We had great rookies last year. This year, rookies class might be even better. Corbin Carroll um, not only has a conversation, obviously, to be rookie of the year, rookie uh, eligibility still intact this year, he has a conversation to be MVP this year. That's how great he's been. Another 21-year-old, and he's only gotten better since he got called up last year. We saw the flashes. Um, he leads the NL in slugging OPS and OPS Plus at 167. Now, he would be leading all of baseball in those categories were it not for somebody named Shohei Otani. Like, that, that is how good <laughs> Corbin Carroll is. And, and it, to make things great, too, for Corbin Carroll is he comes into the game with all these rule changes that we see in Major League Baseball, which make it more advantageous for players to steal bases. And Corbin Carroll does that with the best of them. So, like, this is the new prototypical type of player that I think we're going to see. Players like Carroll, players like Ellie De La Cruz, who can really do it all. Athletes in baseball, which makes this sport so much more fun. Corbin's also one of those guys where you just watch him and you think, you know, this happens when you get to the park sometimes where you're like, I'm just going to look at that dude. Like, that's just kind of the vibe he gives off when he's playing. His energy is, is very infectious, but also the team is having fun. Zach Allen, the ace, did you see him the other night? He wore a snakeskin belt to go with the <laughs> Serpientes uniform. These guys having a great year. He's out here styling on him on the mound. I'm not going to say that there's a world in which the MLB is better if Arizona's got a good team. It's not that big of a deal. But it is fun to see a squad that can barely get their roof open to play a game finally actually winning something. So the Diamondbacks, they got 9,000 uniforms that all look completely different. But they do got a couple of fun stories this year. And the Dodgers, for once, are looking like it might not be them that wins the division. Even though it's only June, all the games count the same, guys. By the way, Drew, we heard Clinton tell us the, the nickname that he had for the Diamondbacks the other day, the Snakes. <laughs> I had never heard the Diamondbacks I referred to as the either. Snakes before. It's, it's great. I love it. If you go to Phoenix, shout out to my man Mike Farron, who does their um, radio broadcast. Yeah, the Snakes. They're I like it. Suns and the Snakes. That's, they're right there next to each other. <laughs> There's beauty in the simplicity yeah. of that nickname. Uh, right. So that's, that's some good baseball. Sam, we've got some really bad baseball yeah. that we want to show the viewers right now. Yeah, really bad being the operative word there. <laughs> uh, our good friend Scooby and I went down to uh, the CT Rage facility down in Newtown, Connecticut. We tried to take some hacks, 
hacks, and I mean hacks, off some high school <laughs> pitchers. Take a look. I feel like overall we're just not very good at baseball. Good work. Let's go. All right, we are here at the home of the Connecticut Rage. We are going to see how hard it actually is to hit a baseball off a couple of pitchers. Oh, yeah, I'm out of breath. What's your level of experience with baseball? Absolutely none. What I swing at? Coach, what are we going to see here? What are some of the players and obviously their aspirations to play the next level? The team that's behind you is our uh, 15 to 17 group, a really talented group. Most of these kids will go on and play college ball. San Marco is going to get on the mound for It's like 83, 85. Yeah, that's a problem. So, to see the ball. How nervous should we be today? I'm pretty nervous. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna go and try, try being a layoperative word here to hit a baseball. What stance do I use? I'm a little snugger than I used to. You should have gave him some swings, bro. <laughs> you should have gave him some practice swings. Oh, we gotta be kidding me. Oh Jesus! We oh, gotta bet. Jesus, yeah. better start from swing like that. He ain't touching nothing. Lighten it up. The thing is, I'm just trying to see Sam's technique. Nick, they got any shot hitting this ball? Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely no. not. <laughs> yeah. We might get a, I'll tell you what, we might get a foul tip. I'm Brandon San Marco. I'm 17 years old. Uh, I go to Daniel Hand High School, and I'm in 11th grade. Would you throw him right there? Give him a little sinker. Sam, how we feeling? Uh, really not good. All I know is I'm gonna get one of those balls. <laughs> okay, if it's a bunny. <laughs> <laughs> that was a ball. The <laughs> pick. <laughs> Did this really happen? <laughs> Ian Moore, 15, Fairfield Ludlow High School. Knuckle ball. What is that? He's got a knuckle ball. Oh, wow. Well, that'd be good information to know. Wow. <laughs> Nasty curveball. Oh, boy. Is that good? Is that the swing of, like, what I swing at? Uh, backs up against the wall here. We'll try to get, uh, try to get a good bat with the ball. Sam's got plenty of hacks, but he hasn't made contact yet. I have faith in him. He's gonna get one. I told you, there's the one. He worked for that. Great job, guys. Yeah. You guys clearly got a bright future, and we don't at all. That's no. why we don't play this yes. sport. We, yeah, we are officially retired. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still sore. I mean, that that was whew. embarrassing. Uh, I don't think really puts it into words well enough. That was that was bad. I see, they didn't do much to try to teach you either. Everybody knows that when you're getting the cage, way to gauge up the speed of the ball at first is to lay down a punt before you ever swing. That's how you do that. And yeah. That, that quad box was just <laughs> heinous. It was bad. That was, yeah. that was criminal for you. The, the editors didn't do you any favors either. No, they, so. they actually did a great job. But <laughs> uh, it, it reinforced my, my belief that hitting a baseball is still one of, if not the hardest things to do in sports. Would you agree with that, Clinton? Uh, absolutely. It's definitely one of the hardest things to do in sports, especially when the other person is motivated to embarrass you, which <laughs> right. is clearly the case with these high schoolers who look like they were having a blast making you guys corkscrew yourself into the ground. That was pretty funny. Good job. The, the, we do it for the content, Drew. Do it for the content. I mean, those dudes were nasty. When the 15-year-old came out, I was like, oh, no. But right. th this could be bad. He, he threw me a knuckleball. <laughs> <laughs> he threw me a knuckleball. <laughs> you don't know it's coming? That's terrifying. You know, that's funny. Chin music, knuckleball. Um, all right, so <laughs> speaking of getting embarrassed, the Oakland A's fans tried to embarrass the ownership of the team earlier this week. On Tuesday, you might have seen this. It was a reverse boycott. That's what they were calling it because the A's are last in MLB in attendance this year. They packed out the Coliseum with over 27,000 fans, which was more than triple their season average. And on that same night, we learned that the Nevada State Legislature approved a $380 million public money package in Nevada, which is basically what everyone thinks the final nail in the coffin for this team moving from Oakland to Vegas. So, Clinton, we saw this scene. They had the sell the team shirts. They were chanting sell the team. Sounded like there was real anger among the fans in Oakland. What is your reaction to this situation? 
You know, the analogy I would use is I don't necessarily think that this group thought that, A, they were going to pack out the stadium and the whole world was going to go, oh, my God, how can it be possible that the A's are moving out of Oakland? I think it was just a basic form of dignity for the fans of Oakland to just say, hey, we need you to officially know we don't like this. And if this is the last chance that they get to do it in a unified way, I totally understand that. A lot of people were laughing at them saying, oh, you couldn't even get a sellout during the game that you were trying to do the thing. And that wasn't really the point, in my opinion. I think it was more so just for themselves to remind everybody, like, yeah, we're not happy with this choice. Now, that said, the story in general is really tough, man. People forget Oakland is the third place the Athletics have been after Philadelphia years ago and Kansas City before that. And so a team to be on their fourth city after the most beloved place it was literally just celebrated the 50-year anniversary of their three winning title, three World Series winning title teams. It's just a sad state of affairs, man. You know, you can argue back and forth about whether or not the fans have given enough for them to decide to want to stay, but I don't feel good about it, and that has nothing to do with Las Vegas per se. I've been to that Aviators Park out there. It's nice, but it just kind of feels like they're taking the cheap road out in a town that's already showed a lot of love to not just that team, but plenty of other teams that have left as well. It's really unfortunate. Well, I mean, Clint, you're not the only one that doesn't really feel right about this either. I mean, you have players speaking out. We'll get to that in a little, a little bit. Players speaking out saying this doesn't feel right. Oakland is a very passionate fan base, and the narrative that that they're not is just simply not true. I mean, th- this is th- it really, and you see Bryce Harper's comments here. I, I yeah. think the reverse boycott, to your point, Clinton, just gave this fan base that has been neglected, deprived of winning for so long, or at least the appearance of, hey, we're trying to win. It gave them an opportunity to just kind of vent and, and just go out there and, and kind of give it uh, – you know, give it their all, for, right. for, for lack of a better right. word. I mean, it, it's a really sad day, I think. It, it, I don't know if it could have been avoided, but you, you, you like to think the optimism in me likes to think it could have been avoided. Like, we could have figured this out. Well, also, let's. the other key point of that point is that Bryce Harper is from Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, if a guy from Vegas in the bigs is talking about a team moving there in such a strange manner, like – that's got to set off some alarms as to what is actually happening here. I don't know anybody who's like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to go to that Vegas A's game. Like, it just feels like something that's very forced, and it feels like it's something that's, quite frankly, petty between the owner and the city, and that's just not any kind of way to run a baseball franchise. Yeah, and the, the Oakland mayor came out and said as well, they were basically a third base for getting a new stadium deal in Oakland, uh, and you got to feel for the fans. They lost the Warriors. I know they're just across the bay, and now it seems like they'll probably – lose the athletics yeah. as well. Uh, but Clinton, let's go on a more positive note. Let, let's go to one of our favorite segments here on the show. Let's go to snag, grab, or stab. At the wall, he leaps. Oh, he brought it back. Walter will dive and make the grab. Oh, oh, oh he made the catch. This is the game I play on the internet when people make crazy baseball catches. Wow, we got a logo. Women's College World Series. All right, this was a heck of a play here. Snag, grab, or stab is basically just my fun way of highlighting different catches from around the sports world. This was in Oklahoma City. Doesn't get much better than that. That's a snag for me. What about you guys? Oh, for sure. That, that I mean, look, any, any home run robbery or any sort of robbery is always going to be a snag for me. I say grab. I, I say grab. Grabbing a run from the opposing team. Hey. I think that one might have been a walk-off, too, for a run rule, Clinton. It was it was going to lose the game. It was going to win the game, rather, if they got it out. So, all right, let's get back to – this was in the Super Regionals or the Regionals. This is a heck of a play, too. This one was also believed to be a walk-off. Not as great of a catch, but there was just something about it that was so clutch. Look at the reversal of fortune. Get your shirt off for the lads. Let's go. This is a, this is a grab for me. I, I like the grab, although the fence is a little bit short for me. So I don't know. Like yeah. a, a home run robbery, I think you got to jump a little bit more. I'll go grab. And, and I want to give a shout out to the cameraman, too, who totally thought that was leaving the yard. <laughs> and, and, and we all thought so as well. So I'll go snag, but I just want to shout out the camera guy. All right, we'll get to the bigs here. Zach, you know, this snag grabber stab, this was a heck of a play because he basically had to make a calculation. Ooh. Didn't go oh. great, but he still managed to nail it with the back. <laughs> this is a. Ah, this is a tough one. This is kind of a, maybe a snag for me, yeah. The Fighting Campbell Camels. Yes. Zach, I mean, this kid yeah. was playing college ball last year. That's a terrific play. 
I go stab, because he kind of stabbed. It was sort of an awkward move. It, it ended up being the right motion at the end, but I go stab there. Yeah, I'll go Not stab your too. normal stab, but that was definitely a good one. Oh. And of course, this play, I didn't even know what to call this from the Portland Pickles in single-A ball. Great reaction, great finish, and great actual whatever. Catch. It's a hard one for me. I don't even have one for that. Very hand, Betsy, great call. <laughs> Just, I, he, he jarred it. I mean, they're the Pickles. He jarred it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Oh, that's good, Drew. Yeah. Very good. He, he fermented it. Uh, what a what a grab. Ice up that hand, too. That, that's actually, yeah. that's not what it's there for. Uh, but before yeah. we get out of here, we do want to say happy Father's Day to everyone yep. celebrating out there. Of course, Carl will be on the call for Red Sox Yankees later tonight. That's starting in just a couple minutes over on ESPN TV. And hey, I've got a, you got a lot of great memories with your dad in baseball, Oh, right? terrific. I think we all do. I think that's yeah. what makes this great, right? It's just, you know, you remember those days, right? You're with your dad, whether it's playing catch in the backyard, you're throwing a ball. Um, this is just a special day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you actually got a chance to uh, surprise him earlier on on baseball tonight. We did, yeah. And he called this a podcast, which <laughs> I don't know why he did that, but that made him sound like he was 80 years old. <laughs> Check this out. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. I think that will do it for us here. I know you got whoa, a whole whoa, whoa, other whoa, whoa. hour. Pause, you were... pause, what? pause. Pause. What do we got? I just what want to got? say happy oh, Father's Day. Look at that. I, I just want to come wow. and say surprise. Happy Father's Day, Coney, Eduardo, Dad. Great to see you. Full disclosure, I did text you earlier and said happy Father's Day. No response. So I don't know what that's about. Bit, but uh, did wanna, I, I, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Um, I did not get you a Father's Day gift. Um, but in lieu of that, what we did do, yeah. I remember Mrs. Jones in second grade told me, make sure it's not materialistic. It's got to be heartfelt. So here's what we went with. And happy Father's Day. To you, Dad. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up, and it's gonna be uh, in your office, uh, hanging up when you return. <laughs> I'm gonna get it Very framed. Sweet. We just haven't figured out what frame's gonna go on it yet. So that's what we got. All right. Well, that that's beautiful. Cause yep. I remember we have a picture just like that where his hands were were way smaller than that. Yeah. Sam hosting the uh, baseball tonight digital podcast or digital show, I should say for us. So. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. That's really nice. Yeah. We appreciate you saying Best happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was a great. bit of a surprise. I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. If it's on the internet, it's a podcast. I guess right? everything's a podcast <laughs> these days. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Look at this. This is great. Look, look at Ravi up there. I mean, what a style. That's back when we knew how to play baseball, by the way, <laughs> when we actually made contact with the ball, more importantly. Yeah. yeah he, this he, is a great collage, by the way. He didn't give you enough pointers. Yeah, this, this is dads from across the crew. And uh, we just want to say shout out to all the dads out there. Happy Father's Day. It feels right to play baseball on Father's Day. Sure does. Yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. Uh, un unless your back is, is bad, then you can <laughs> go play some golf or sit. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks for hanging out with us here on BBTN Live, the first one of the season, hopefully the first of many this summer. Enjoy Yanks Red Sox game two of the doubleheader over on ESPN Television. And happy Father's Day to everyone out there. That's a podcast, too, right? <laughs>